Ready to boost your confidence in the bedroom? Try Blue Chew, the chewable that delivers a powerful performance when you need it the most. Visit BlueChew.com now and use promo code HOLLY to try it for free. Just pay $5 in shipping. Experience the difference with Blue Chew today. Hey everyone, welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. My guest today is a journalist, content creator, and advocate that has worked on so many projects to destigmatize sex work. She was a longtime anchor on Naked News. That's how I had the fortune of meeting her the first time. And she now hosts the YouTube series Red Umbrella Talk, filmed at New York's Museum of Sex. Welcome, Laura Desiree. Hello, hello. Hello. What an honor. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh. No, it's such a pleasure to see you. And it's so funny because the roles are reversed now. I'm interviewing you. I am clothed. You are clothed. Yeah. Yeah. It's so different than our first experience together. It's a brave new world. (laughs) (laughs) But this is a thrill for me. It really is. I've been such a fan since my first knowledge of you. So this is a big one for me today. Oh my gosh. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks. It always feels like I don't know. It's always surprising to me that people. Oh, Holly, come on. No, I'm not even kidding. I'm not I, like it still is weird to me that like I'm, I still don't think anybody listens to my show. Come on. It's an institution with not just within the industry, but anyone looking for a little insight into what these lives are like. Yeah, it's incredible. No, it's done. It's done much better than I ever expected. I'm yeah. super grateful. But you know how it is like you just I don't know. Well, thank you for keeping at it, is what I'll say. Because in today's temporary podcast experiences, Mm -hmm. it's like someone gets into it, it maybe goes a season, it maybe goes two seasons, Mm -hmm. and then it, you know, we we close it. I yeah. have a lot of experience with that. So yeah. having this continue is uh, is powerful. Thank you. This is actually episode 301. No way. By the way. Yep. <laughs> My 300th it. episode was... Um... Gerard Butler. Oh, no, this is 302. <laughs> 302. Sorry. My, yes, because I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead because I record episodes and then I re- release them later. This is 302. 302. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. So, yeah, I know. It's crazy that it's gone on this long and I didn't expect it to. But, um, you know, I just, I don't know. There's so many interesting people to talk to, like mm-hmm. yourself. Mm-hmm. I've noticed over the, uh, the few, I guess, weeks and months, I've seen you start to talk to experts, educators, people outside of just the performance aspect of of the industry? You know, I've always done that. Um, I actually started off, uh, like I really wanted to diversify. Mm. If you watch some of my first episodes, actually our, we were speaking, our mutual friend Derek Brown was one of my first interviews. He's like not in sex work at all, (gasps) but he writes like sexy poetry. So I was like, "Ah, that's close enough to sex. I'm like, come on. And you know, and he's really fun and stuff like that. I I actually love the sex educators, and I find that those episodes are so are so interesting, but mm. it sucks because they don't do as well nearly uh, at yeah. all. People like always want like the big name porn stars, of course. and the, the some of my favorite episodes that I think are the best ones are the ones that like don't get the views that they deserve. Yeah, but you keep doing, that. and I'm always like, come on, people! Like well, this is, is good material. I, I, I think we're in what our generation's revolution is when it Mm -hmm. comes to like sexuality is this is a social sex revolution, Mm -hmm. you know, because we look at our parents or grandparents and they had the pill and they had the free sex Mm -hmm. movements, but this is like about talking Mm -hmm. about sex in a really brave and honest way. And that's what I think this is. And so you are actually contributing to that as, as in a leadership role in the social sex revolution to keep these conversations going and to bring these stories out. So like, that's profound. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. I'm really thrilled that the first five minutes of this episode is about me. (laughs) (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) So enough about me, Mm. um, about you. So, I mean, you have, we have so much to cover. You've done so much, but I guess let's start at the beginning. Sure. So how did you get into the adult industry? Yeah. Uh, I left film school in New York City. I graduated at like 19 or 20, maybe. Uh, It was a two-year program, and uh, I I wanted to get into 
independent filmmaking. Mm -hmm. But I also loved nightlife. And I ended up climbing on a lot of bar tops and becoming a go-go dancer and eventually got the shoulder tap that lured me into burlesque. So then there was the striptease element. And I did that for years. I still dabble in it a little mm -hmm. bit, but I loved the experience of revealing myself and mm -hmm. seducing for the masses or sometimes for an audience of two, three or five. Yeah. But, um, so I, I found a lot of power in that and I felt so excited to be in that state of autonomy mm -hmm. and sensual erotic expression. So it was very natural to continue exploring it. Um, obviously my burlesque days was well before independent content creators. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I ventured into some more sensual styled performances, more art performances that weren't necessarily traditional burlesque. Um, I ran a very edgy cabaret in Toronto that was called Candyland. And um, I, I got poked by a show called Naked News. And they said, hey, we know you do burlesque. It would be a really cool episode if you joined our show and taught the other anchors on our cast a burlesque routine. Mm -hmm. So I went in and sure enough, I taught them everything I knew, the glove peel, the seduction of the stocking coming down and the slow undressing rhythmically and, and with that enchanting touch. And uh, they said, well, my goodness, can you read a teleprompter? You're, there's something about you that's, that's really exciting. And I did. And wow. then I got into reading the news naked on a green screen and did it for seven years. <laughs> and how was that? I mean, so had you heard of naked news before they oh, yeah. hit you up? Okay. Never, and what did you think of like, uh, you know, the whole idea of just like naked women reading the news? I, I remember this show. I remember naked news has been, it's kind of a legacy web series. I mean, mm -hmm. it's been going for over 20 years. It was on Playboy TV for a long time. It was in a bunch of hotel rooms in Europe. I'm pretty sure it had a channel in Asia. Mm -hmm. um, I always remember hearing about naked news and in Toronto, because you can legally be topless on the street, they would do a lot of filming on the streets of Toronto. Mm. I remember in my youth encountering, you know, maybe once in a blue moon, a topless woman standing with a camera pointed at her holding a microphone, either interviewing other people on the street or just reading something direct to the camera. I knew of Naked News. Mm -hmm. It got lost in my mind over the years. But the minute that someone dropped me that email and said, do you wanna come into the fold of Naked News? I thought, oh my God, yeah, this is kind of, uh, uh, harmonious. Mm -hmm. I've known about this for so long. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't know they were still going. I didn't know it was still a thing. Um, I didn't really know what the show was about. Um, and I learned all of that very quickly. It was, it was exciting. I just threw myself into it. Yeah. Do you find that like the news topics that they choose to cover, did they tend to not be terribly serious because people are naked? I just like, I don't know. I just imagine like somebody naked, like delivering, like, you know, news about like the war in Ukraine. Like it just, yeah. you know what I mean? Well, did you find that they like kind of chose certain of stories? Course. Okay. Of course, our modern world has so much heartbreaking news. Yeah. So many stories that are just, you can't avoid them and they're intensely tragic. Uh, it seems that war and uh, misfortune is striking across the globe, not to be a negative Nancy here, not to be a, a dark rain cloud, but the idea of naked news is that the audience, the viewers very likely have their dick in their hand. Mm. We don't want to <laughs> interfere with that. We don't do stories about mass death. Yeah. There weren't stories about uh, any of the unbelievable crimes and mass shootings or anything yeah. with minors would never touch that. Yeah. Would never touch that. So unfortunately, sometimes it was about a new Burger King fusion sandwich, you know? That, you know what though? Like yeah. that's kind of nice yeah. because especially, you know, the news channels today, yeah. they just feed off a cycle of fear because that's what sells. Yeah. The two things that sell the best in society is sex and fear, right? The Naked News has a sex part covered. And then, you know, CNN's got all the death and the yeah. crime and the it's sadness. True. You know, if you want to, like, watch something. You know, my father, like, towards the end of his life when he was, like, kind of mostly bedridden was just watching, like, CNN just, 
you know, constant, that 24 hour news cycle. And I'm just like, this is so depressing. Yeah. Like, doesn't this just make you depressed? Yeah. Like, cause it makes you feel like you live in this world that is just yeah. fraught with like so much horrific things happening, which isn't necessarily untrue, but it's also like, you know, we choose to focus, like, what do you choose to focus on? You know, well, do you choose to feed yourself all this constant negative or do you choose to like watch naked news and like watch a hot chick talk about the lega- latest Burger that. King fusion yeah. sandwich? And I love that. And I love that. And that's why to me, I was like, this brings joy to people's yes. lives, you know? Yes. I mean, during the pandemic, especially like what you're saying about how much of that information we receive of our troubled world, what it can do for us. My goodness, I felt that and I reached my limit. Mm-hmm. Remember, there were those days where you just have the TV on being like, how far is this insanity going to go mm-hmm. with this pandemic and I reached a limit and said I, I need a break yeah you know then I started watching my own clips on naked news and, and then like, you felt okay, so much better yeah, I felt so much better <laughs> <laughs> so what was your first day on naked news like like did it feel weird standing there delivering the news like I, I mean I know you did burlesque and you did the strip tease. I'm assuming you got fully naked in those I, I did yeah 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 when I did more of the shock content performance right. I loved being naked yeah right but so did it feel strange to you, like being in this kind of static environment on a green screen with like a, you know what I mean? Like not actively engaging in this whole dance. Like, That's did that feel weird? Exactly it. Not engaging in the dance. Yeah. Because on Naked News, you're not really standing in these, you know, structural poses that we do in, say, burlesque, where you can kind of manipulate Mm -hmm. the silhouette. Mm -hmm. You're standing there blank as, you know, the day you were born. And you're just, you're standing there. You're delivering the news in that very upright in your face, full frontal way that we do. And uh, yeah, it felt so awkward because I wanted to hinge my body in certain ways. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not a curvy girl, right? I'm, I'm like a column holding up a building. I'm very, <laughs> I'm, I'm a skyscraper. Yeah. Um, so I like to usually put a bend in it somewhere yeah. to kind of give it a little more swing maybe down there. And we didn't, we don't do that on Naked News. You stand straight, stark, and you get fully naked. So yeah, that was kind of intimidating. Yeah. And then there's, uh, when you're on the green screen, when you leave the the segment, there's the turn and the walk away. The turn and the walk away. Oh, Mike, <laughs> that thing terrified me. Because, again, I can't slink away like the Pink Panther is playing. Like, you got to turn and walk away. I think that you should have made the segments your own and just, yeah. like, done a whole dance. Like, <laughs> so what do you think about the latest hamburger fusion? And then just, like, did this whole thing while they're answering and then just came back and be like, and what else? You know what? <laughs> Unfortunately, I wasn't the official producer of the show. So you didn't, you didn't I, I didn't make those calls. I couldn't make those calls entirely. But I did start producing some of my own segments uh, mm. over the years there. And, oh, yeah, I had some fun with it. Oh, yeah. So I remember when you came to interview me. Um, I'm used to being around naked people all the time, like, obviously. But it was... It wasn't weird, but it was, like, interesting to be interviewed by somebody who's naked. Have you ever had an experience where you interviewed someone and they, like, literally couldn't concentrate on the questions that you were asking them? And then, do you know what I mean? Yeah, all the time, especially when I would do interviews with the general public. Not um, not someone who's been prepped. You know, when, when we go in and do an interview, if I'm talking to a sex a sex expert or a mm-hmm. doctor or another performer. They know what to expect. But there was a segment called Naked in the Streets that we would do. And I still can't believe how the fuck did I have the bravery to do this, to stand on a street corner, either in New York, we did this in New York and in Toronto, two cities where you can legally be topless. And you're interviewing people as they pass by. You grab them and you ask, hey, can I, can I ask you something? Then you take the top off, then you deliver the question. It's amazing how disarming it is to people. And they weren't expecting you to take the top off? I would always let them know. I would always say to them, this is naked news. Are you ready? I'm going to take my top off. And even when they say, yeah, 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 that's that's cool. That's cool. You take your top off and they they don't even hear the question. (laughs) They don't hear the question. They don't know their name. They don't know uh, which way is up or down. They the, The look of fear, shock, uh, total explosive stimulation, all of it in one. Yeah. I, I do, I do love that. It's a fantastic study in just how mortal we are. Yeah. You know, <laughs> some of my favorite set, you know, you know, you see those like little clips on the internet and it's 
someone doing like a news story and there's some weird person in the background who does something to like fuck with the news anchor yeah. or whatever. Did you have experience? I mean, you must have had people standing in the back, you know, oh. just like jaw on the floor. When we would shoot those in the streets, you would get people that would surround in a circle behind the camera guy. Um, they would definitely float in the background and give some like, ooh, or some mm -hmm. commentary, some ridiculous cartoonish reaction all the time. Mm -hmm. It was a major distraction. Like, I got to give myself credit. That's, yeah. that's a, a level of focus and professionalism that is truly unmatched by... Most people in that position. Yeah. I mean, my goodness. Fuck trying to give, like, do interviews in like a hurricane with 130 right. mile per hour winds. Right. You try to ask somebody a question naked. <laughs> Come on, Anderson Cooper. Right. You got nothing on her. Try it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> so, where, so you were with Naked News for seven years? Yeah. And what, like, kind of progressed from there? Uh, for seven years, I mean, when I first joined the show, I, uh, I had about a few months of just, entering in as an anchor, reading scripts that they provided for me, and I had a burning desire to do more. Mm. I saw this show, I saw the freedom within the content. I saw, wow, we can talk about sexuality. Mm -hmm. This is something I'm genuinely interested in. I wanna lead some investigations. I have too many ideas. Mm. I'm constantly idea explosions nonstop. So I said, hey, I, I've got an idea for this and for that and for that, whether it's a series on how to improve your dirty talk, whether it's spending a week with this naturist resort or this swingers getaway, and I would action it. I did all of the legwork to get you know, logistics done, locations, um, all the clearances, all the permissions, all of the production that goes into that, I handled and I ended up doing a slew of exciting, fabulous adventures for that show. And uh, I'm, I'm awfully proud of it. We did some things that I don't think the show ever imagined we'd do, like standing on the red carpet at the Toronto International Film Festival. Mm -hmm. That's a big event. That's a very Naked. corporate, I wore a blazer with nothing under it. And when I had my opportunities, I gave a flash to the camera. Okay, gotcha. But, you know, access to events that I don't think they thought we would ever attend. Mm -hmm. uh, and I loved that challenge. Mm. You know, I loved finding ways to pitch our attendance to different conventions, different awards and, and find my way in, mm -hmm. you know, that negotiation just gets me off. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. So seven years of that, you know, uh, of really riding that high of producing this content and writing my own scripts, um, building my own investigations, the questions that go into it. And I had a really good relationship with my producer in, you know, was it so much collaboration or me just saying, we're going to do it this way? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I got to do a lot of the things that I I wanted. And and I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for that. It was very empowering. Right. Yeah. So what made you decide to leave after the seven years? Had you just had it just run its course? Yeah, I relocated to New York City uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hadn't lived there in like nine years. But I wanted to go back. I wanted to feel the re- awakening of a city after the destruction of the pandemic. And uh, I, I wanted to take a chance on myself as an independent. And uh, I did see the limitations within the brand of Naked News. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a negative, mm -hmm. but um, good branding is tight branding. Yeah. And in the case of Naked News, there's certain subject matter that we don't enter into, mm -hmm. whether it's um, the queer experience. Mm -hmm whether it is the politics around sex work, mm -hmm. whether it is the realities of, say, stigma, whether it is far too deep into the taboos of sexual behaviors. Mm -hmm. These are areas that fascinate me, uh, and I want to be able to go into them and present them to an audience without worrying, oh, is this going to rub them the wrong way? Mm -hmm. Ooh, is this going to be a mismatch for everything else this legacy has been built around? Because there were experiences of that. Mm where I start interviewing someone and we both reach an emotional level, or maybe we're discussing trauma. Maybe we're discussing some really hard realities about being a sexually experienced person. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't fit the show. Right. It just, it didn't fit what they're trying to do. Yeah. And these are things that I am so compelled to explore. Yeah. So 
I had to do that. You know, it's so interesting that you say that because I remember when I first started this show, I didn't really like know what it was going to be. I was just like, I'm just going to interview people in the adult industry and yeah. we'll just see how it goes. And, you know, I figured it would probably be a pretty lighthearted um, conversation, yeah. funny and stuff like that. And then episode, I believe it was number nine, was with August Ames. Mm. And she talked about her issues with depression and suicide and stuff like that. And then, you know, as many of us know, she committed suicide a few months later. And that, like, kind of shifted everything for me. Because I remember when we were talking, she was revealing all this stuff about her that I didn't expect and I was not prepared for. And I was just like... In my head, I'm like, wait, does she know that, like, this is like that we're recording this? You know, does she like want this out there? And I just, you know, just remember being so surprised. And then afterwards, I asked her, I said, you know, you revealed like really personal stuff. I'm like, are you sure you want to publish that? And she was like, yes, you know, I do. Like, I want to be open. And, and I checked in with her, I'm not joking, three times. And I was like, are you sure? And then, um, and then I released the episode and the response was, overwhelming in terms of like the people who really her story resonated with them because they'd had like similar experiences or it made them see her as more of a human mm -hmm. you know because I wasn't sure how it was gonna look and it made me realize that there people do you know I think some people really need to hear other people's trauma to help them touch their own yeah. and maybe explore their own and maybe heal from their own and I didn't see that until I did that episode with her um, so that really kind of shifted everything. And I was like, wow, this podcast could actually be about so much more than like, you know, the 10 man orgy that you did, or like the one time that like he accidentally stuck it in your butt. You know what I mean? Like, I'm so glad I'm so, I, I mean, that's, that's so pivotal. Yeah. And it was such a tragedy that obviously would happen of course. afterwards. Um, you know, and August was so lovely and I was just devastated, but yeah. And, and since then it's, you know, I've, it depends on my guest. It's mm. like whatever they want to talk about, whatever mm. they want to be open about. And some people have been incredibly open and there's been tears and it's yeah. been like, and you know, you never, I never thought I would get that from like a porn podcast and it's been, Isn't, but it's been great. I, I, I know exactly what you've been through when it, when it comes to having that unexpected access to yeah. someone as an interviewer myself, yeah. it is, we go into a situation or, or a, an appointment, let's say, where mm -hmm. I'm interviewing so and so, and sometimes it's just miraculous yeah. what they reveal. And it makes you realize like some people just need they need someone to talk to about this stuff. You know? And I feel like especially these days with social media and how mm. everything's so distracting. Like one of the things that I love about doing a podcast, and I'm sure mm. you can, you know, obviously relate because you do the same thing, is how often do you sit down with somebody with mm. no other distractions, no phone, no nothing, and talk to them for like an hour? I can't be on my phone? You're telling me I can't just sit here and be on my phone right now, Holly? I, I agree. I really do. It's sacred, and uh, it's becoming more rare in mm -hmm. our modern world to yeah. sit and actually do this. Um, and, you know, when you do have someone that cares to share, feels comfortable enough to share something that deep, yeah. something that precious, as, as painful as it is, as precious as it is, it grants permission to others who hear mm -hmm. it to maybe even just in their own private moment, go there and address what they're feeling, address what they've been through. That's why it's important to do this. Yeah. Right. It's, yeah. it's important to, to keep hosting these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just been, it's been really amazing. Mm. So we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about a little bit more about your personal experiences. And then obviously want to get to your um, red umbrella talk project. So hang tight guys. We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Blue Chew, the game changer that will take your performance to new heights. Blue Chew is not just about solving ED problems. It's about giving you the extra confidence that you deserve. Picture this, you're in the heat of the moment and you want to bring your A game. With Blue Chew, you'll have the stamina and the staying power to make every intimate moment unforgettable. Whether you're looking to impress a new partner or reignite the spark in your relationship, Blue Chew has got your back. But it doesn't stop there. Blue Chew offers a discreet and hassle-free online service, eliminating the need for awkward doctor visits or pharmacy lines. You'll receive a personalized treatment plan tailored to your needs all from the comfort and privacy of your own home. 
Blue Chew believes that everyone deserves to feel confident and satisfied in the bedroom. That's why they offer different subscription plans, allowing you to choose the one that fits your lifestyle best. It's convenient, discreet, and confidence, all rolled into one. So are you ready to take control of your performance? Visit BlueChew.com today and reclaim your confidence in the bedroom. Still unsure? Try it out for free. Just pay $5 shipping with my code HOLLY. That's BlueChew.com promo code HOLLY to receive your first month for free. Okay, guys, we are back. Okay, so Laura, let's talk a little bit about you, um, your upbringing, your family life. Mm -hmm. Um, Does your family know what you're doing? You have a twin too, right? An identical twin, (laughs) which is amazing. I think I told you this before because like identical twins are super rare, right? But like hot identical twins are, I feel like, so rare. I just find identical twins fascinating. I, you know what? It's it is a fascinating life. Identical twins. It's a curse and a blessing. Um, the the psychological torment that we can inflict upon each other in a just a glance mm. is unreal. Yeah. I mean, obviously we use our powers for good. We try and support each other, but like this shit's real. And, uh, over the years, it's been a really funny ride because I've always been so exhibitionist and so proud to be naked and free about my sensuality. And, you know, I remember her early days of say dating someone, I would say, I'm going to a burlesque. I'm going to do a burlesque show tonight. You guys should come out. Well, he and I haven't uh, done that yet. So I don't know if I want him getting the full visual of you because it's actually me before <laughs> I've had the chance <laughs> oh my to God. do it. Of course. He's like, I really want to see this girl naked. Right. I can just go see her twin do burlesque right. and then I know what I'm getting into. Right. And so I, I had to respect that. I'm like, you know what? I That's totally funny. get that. So and uh, it's true because we our bodies are identical. Yeah. It's crazy, identical twins, but uh, it's it's been it's been wonderful. My family knows what I do. Um, my father is a huge supporter, especially when I, you know, take a leadership role in any project I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, he's very proud. Mm-hmm. I am so lucky to come from a non-judgmental upbringing. Mm. Um, we were extremely tight growing up. Um, My father raised my sister and I. I lost my mother when I was 10. But this was after a five-year battle with really vicious cancer (sighs) that pretty much limited her to living in hospitals. So I grew up in a lot of hospitals. And uh, being around that much strain and stress and, you know, adults leaning into your face saying, you're so strong, you're so strong, you're so Mm -hmm. strong. There wasn't really an opportunity to be anything but strong Mm -hmm. and invincible. And it's been a journey of my own over the years to be compassionate towards myself Mm -hmm. about grief and about um, emotions. And, you know, they used to come to me in outbursts when I was little. Yeah. I would have explosions, temper tantrums on the floor, kicking, screaming. Yeah. Um, Because like as a child, you don't know how to process that grief. No, at all. And it compounds in so many different ways. Just the, the reality the terror. Is this really happening? Am I losing a parent? Mm-hmm. Um, and to this day, I'm still trying to find the way to really honor my father because my goodness, I crumble to the most ridiculous shit these days. Like I have to do five things in a day. This man had two 10 year old daughters who were approaching six feet tall by 11 and a full career in radio. And he, he stood by, he stuck around. He dedicated his life to raising us with culture, with appreciation for art, with pride in ourselves, with a comfort about some of the darker aspects of reality. I mean, we watched so many movies, Yeah, you know, things that I I don't know if I was old enough to watch at the time, but we would talk about them afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where my love of investigation and journalism and opinion came from because we would talk about them. We didn't really talk about the grief. We didn't really talk about- He was probably just trying to keep you like, distracted and yeah. giving you a childhood. We, we used, we used our critique of movies and music as a way to share the emotions we were feeling. Right. So we would watch a movie and I, I forever have this, this memory. We watched, uh, the English patient. Mm. 
<laughs> and uplifting. Uh, oh, so uplifting. That's such a feel-good movie. I just remember my dad breaking down, yeah. losing it. Yeah. And we paused the movie, and my sister and I were like, Dad, what are you doing? And he said, well, I have to be mom and dad, so I'm allowed to cry. Yeah. And, you know, that's those were the opportunities we had to be emotional, was mm -hmm. in sharing movies. Yeah. It was less confrontational than sitting down, staring at each other and saying, are you okay? Are you okay? What's grief feel like in you today? Yeah. We did it through movies. Yeah. And it's an education that I'm very lucky to have because, my God, pop culture references. Mm -hmm. That shit's the basis of comedy, connection, and pure magic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but isn't that also, like, what art is there for as well, you know, to – that's how we, like, share our collective human experience. Totally. And those totally. – yeah, and those, you know, those, those pieces, especially if they reflect, like, a part of your life. Yeah. It's, it's important to – interact with art in that way. Yeah. So like, I would love to someday sing his praises and really, like, I don't even know how to put the words to it, but I'm just like, man, that's a powerful legacy that you, you raised us yeah. through that shit. You held it together. You still had a phenomenal career in radio and uh, it's, it's a, it's a capacity that uh, I am, I'm in awe of. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Man, that is rough. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, like I mentioned, I lost my dad six months ago. and mm. But I w had the fortune to, like, you know, like grow up with him and, mm. like, spend, you know, I mean, I'm 44. So he lived, you know, for a very large chunk of my life. And um, I also, like, was able to process his grief, I think, really well, especially, like, because I was sober and I, you know, I'd I'm in the program and I do all this like stuff to like help me process emotions and stuff like that to the point where actually <laughs> I started feeling better earlier than I expected. And I was mm. kind of like, wait a minute. Mm. I almost felt like guilty, you know, because mm. I was able to, to process it better than like say my mom was or something like right. that. And I almost felt bad about that. Right. But, right. but then also, you know, grief like comes in waves as people say, and I'm finally, we're clearing out his room. Um, which was the room that he died in. Uh, mm -hmm. We had to move him downstairs because he couldn't get up the stairs because of his Parkinson's. And I'm finally mm -hmm. clearing it out and redecorating it. And that 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 took a toll on my mental health. I was not expecting. Like the last three days have been like very hard for me. Do you still uh, like have those moments with your mom's passing? Yeah, I uh, I I work once a week with a therapist, and I'm trying more than ever to welcome them. Mm -hmm. To welcome them. Yeah. Before we move past it, you said something about feeling a guilt for the resilience or the, the, the bounce back from it. You also got to take into account you yourself overcame and entered sobriety. Mm. You yourself are a mother. And I know that that shit is fucking wild. <laughs> I know that that ride takes a hell of a lot of strength. <laughs> so you might already have some muscle in the body and the emotional parts of yourself that need that to process. So my God, bravo. And, and it's a long game, right? So yeah. like even, even me today, of course, I still have meltdown days where, I mean, it's not, it's not violent, but it's, it's low. I'm like a low vibration day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's been, that's been a difficult thing to share with, say, a partner in my life. Mm -hmm. Because the minute that you express to someone, hey, I, I deal with grief. Mm -hmm. I deal with trauma. Mm -hmm. I, I, I deal with this experience that happened to me. Everyone, especially if they are a partner or a romantic person in your life, they want to say, well, how do I take that away from you immediately? Mm -hmm. And that's not the expect. That's not the, that's not the job. The job is to be present with me or the person and just say, hey, you're not alone in this. Yeah. Hey, I'm here with you presently. Just as a physical being, you can say whatever you want. You can behave however you want. I'm here with you right now in this. Yeah. Because that's what's, that's what's missing in that moment, right? Yeah. It's very isolating grief. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I lock myself in the bathroom a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a... Uh, it's unlike anything else, my God. Yeah. It's a long journey. But I, I try and uh I try and remember her. My mother was so incredible. I mean, listen, this woman uh was a community leader in our neighborhood. This woman um was was uh 
She could rebuild furniture from nothing. She could cook everything in the world. She could uh, uh, sing and and perform and and just a remarkable woman. My God, before she went into complete uh, palliative care, and she was still coherent enough, she cooked us a year's worth of food, and we froze it in the basement and I remember when we reached that last bag of her spaghetti sauce as a family and we thought it's the last time we're gonna taste mom's cooking oh man I was gonna ask like what that last meal was like yeah it was eight it was eaten very slow (laughs) we're a family that eats like you know horses with a feed bag on but it was it was it was done ceremoniously and then of course the next day it was like we got to learn how to make spaghetti sauce now because no one else could cook my dad was always taking us to you know a a drive-through or the the food court at the mall um so yeah no no we we instantly stepped up to the plate in that moment that's incredible i mean what an act of love and Mm. service i mean that's remarkable. Your mom yeah. knew she was dying. Yeah. So she, her first thought was, what can I do to take care of my family yeah. when I'm gone? Yeah. Let me prepare a year's yeah. worth of food. That's nuts. I know. It's incredible. Wow. What a woman. Ooh. Oh, my gosh. Okay, let's talk <laughs> about porn. <laughs> Please. Dicks. Yeah. Let's let's clean this palette with a little bit of dick talk. I love it. (laughs) I actually I always do this whenever it gets too heavy. What's the perfect penis size for you? Um uh, it's it's um I would say around six and a half, seven. Okay. Six and a half, seven inches. It's 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 a little bigger than average, but that's okay. It's okay. You can you are entitled to like yeah, the dick that you like. Yeah, I you say, know? you know, something to aspire to, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that's 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 my that's my perfect. Mm-hmm. But I'm also not one of those people that's like, oh, that dick's gonna do nothing for me. <laughs> like it's about so much more to me. Like yeah. honestly, I can reach climax before I've even been penetrated. Mm-hmm. Just like you can work it up psychologically, you can work me up by interacting with my neck. This is the gateway right here. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is. Yeah, same back of the neck and back of the shoulders I for me. Know. What I'm like, is my back that? is just, it's a crazy erogenous Like, zone. what is that? It's so strong in yeah. me. I think it's like, you know, there's a lot of nerves there. Your, your skin is thin. And people generally don't touch you there. It's an intimate place to touch you, right? It's very animal, too. Mm, yeah. I just like knowing that, like, oh, if you bite too hard, you could just kill me right now. Yeah. You know? Like, there's something ridiculous. I mean, when you see, like, lion's mate, <laughs> yes. the guy's always, like, biting yes. the neck of the, the female. Exactly. So, so that, to me, like, all that plays in my head. And I yeah. just, I get really hot on it. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think that men are generally doing wrong in the bedroom? Rushing. Rushing themselves. Uh making changes to the moments we declare I'm feeling pleasure, mm-hmm. you know, be it I'm about to come. Why is this instinct to then intensify whatever it is that you're doing? Mm-hmm. Just stay on track. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many women have literally said exactly yeah. that. They're like, don't, don't change it. Like, yeah. You're clearly getting me there. Yeah. So don't like, yeah. Also not building up a vocabulary for their own expressions of pleasure. Mm -hmm. Uh, This may sound so pretentious, but articulation is a fucking huge turn on, Mm. for me especially. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know everyone's trying to please me. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I I think that having a vocabulary around what it is you enjoy and maybe what it is that you desire to experience with someone else Mm -hmm. can actually intensify an encounter. Okay. Uh, Communicating that. Because the mystery is great. The mystery of, I don't know what's going on is fun, but it can also be really limiting of like, I I don't know if you're enjoying this. I don't know if this is successful. I don't know if we're getting anywhere. Like that can actually be an inhibitor to dropping into that erotic trance of the two of you being locked into it or the five of you being locked into it. So like communication, I know it's such a basic, but like I urge you to build up a vocabulary around the sensations that you love, the desires that you have um, with detail. It's not just that you want your ass smacked. 
Think about the 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 the, the grip that you want on it after. Mm. Think about you know the the vibration you want to feel through the skin after. Like think about the temperature. Think about all these things and start speaking them. Mm -hmm. That is that's how you really connect with someone on a very deep level. At least yeah. in my experience, I can only speak of my experience. And so this is probably what led you to feel like you wanted to do pieces on like how to dirty talk. Cause I think a lot of people don't know how to do it. They're embarrassed to do it. Mm. I mean, you know, we talk so much about communication and it's kind of a given in our industry, right? Cause like we have to, mm -hmm. to communicate what's going to happen in the scene because we're creating a product yeah. and the two people may not know each other. And, you know, we want to make sure everybody's no one's crossing boundaries or anything like that. But I think in people's intimate lives, it feels, you know, strange and, um, takes the magic out of it to like talk about what you're going to do. And, you know, like we were sold this idea that in movies and when people magically come together, like there's just this unspoken communication and everything's perfect. Of course. But it's just not generally that way. I'm going to, I'm going to put so many bridges together right now. You ready? Okay. I'm going to build ready. so bridges. many bridges. Um, why am I so passionate about this sacred space of sexuality. So I just told you a little bit about growing up in, in trauma and, and what it takes to survive that and to endure that, being mm -hmm. told that I'm strong and having to uphold that. Mm -hmm. uh, my entire life I've been looking for a place to be completely authentic, potentially ugly, potentially a mess, um, entirely genuine in my, in my being. And sex has been that for me. Mm. Sex has always been that. It's the one arena in life where I can have those honest meltdowns. I can contort in the ways that my natural self wants to. It's why I value sex so greatly. It's why I find it healing. It's why it is every bit necessary for me. It's also why I don't want to do porn completely. Hmm. Okay. Explain, explain that. Because I fear in all of my desire to, and my passion to present, and to be a professional, I fear that I may in some way threaten that experience of sex being the place where I can unleash and mm. I can be whatever it is. I don't want anything to tarnish that space for me. Mm. So My. it's like if you take that. So what I think you're saying is that sex is this very free place where you get to be expressive mm. about who you are and mm. it's very intimate for you. And if you turn that into a job, it changes everything about it for you. I mean, I'm, I'm a I'm a performer. Yeah. I'm a performer. And this only applies to me. I know how many amazing porn performers there are that bring their complete authenticity to it. Mm -hmm. And I fucking commend them wholeheartedly. It's amazing. Uh, not everyone does it. Some people really rely on that dialed in performance. Mm -hmm. And that's fine, too. Mm -hmm. You know, that's totally whatever gets the job done. Yeah. But for myself, I have not found an opportunity in life. Now, in my older years, I have through, you know, honest conversations. But, um, you know, in my late teens, early 20s, sex was the first place I was able to completely be myself and to be maybe not OK or to be a mess or to not be this composed, polished person mm -hmm. that I had to be my whole upbringing. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm like, if I got into porn performing I wonder if I would care too much about it being a good performance and losing that ability to really surrender to it. I think as a performer, yeah. I feel you know? like it's very likely. Yeah. And that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who knows? Maybe I would share my authenticity and it would just be a whole fucking game changer. Yeah. And, you know, the rest is history. Who knows? But for me, that's a very sacred thing. You know, I also feel that sometimes it's unfair that we demand that people tell us why they would do porn mm. or why they wouldn't do porn. Mm. It's like, do you, does everybody really need to explain themselves? And right. it's funny because I have people on the show literally to explain themselves. Why are you in porn? <laughs> why are you not in porn? But, you know, sometimes I just see from the comments that people leave and, 
you know, uh, porn fans are like, why would you do this? You know, yeah. like why, you know, your parents must be so proud and why would you throw away yeah. an opportunity to go to college, to be a porn star, blah, 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 blah. You know, you see a lot of that judgment. Yeah. Um, and then you also see people like, I get this a lot. Like, why won't you do porn? Mm. And I'm like, cause I don't want to. They're like, but why? Yeah. Like every, you work in porn, you work yeah. behind the camera you like shoot all these women who do porn, like yeah. you should do it yeah. too. And I'm just like, liter- and I get to ask this question all the time, I'm especially sure. on my OnlyFans. And I'm just like, cause I don't, wa- like, yeah. you know, obviously like I'm not ashamed of it. Obviously I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I just don't want to. I don't even like watching myself have sex in the mirror. Right. I definitely don't want to be on camera. <laughs> like I, I just, I just don't want to. I, like why I, do I have to explain why I don't listen, want to. I, I just make, don't want to. I make some ugly fucking sounds <laughs> on my way to climax. I make some weird faces. I make some weird decisions in those moments. And if I had a wonderful equipped crew that's looking out for the best shot or the mm-hmm. best moment, I just don't want that voice in my head that's yeah. saying, that's not sexy. Because you know what? To me it is. Yeah. And uh, and so I, I need to defend that. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to defend that and say, you know what? I, I won't be doing full-fledged porn, everyone. I love finding ways to seduce you. I love finding ways to conjure arousal. I do a lot of it on my OnlyFans. I do a lot of it on my Tempted. But when it comes to actually sharing me fucking, no, I'm going to hold on to that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep that for me. It's not what you expect, everyone. But why? <laughs> but why? But why? We want that sound, that gorilla grunt that you make, Laura. We want that. You probably do. You think about it. <laughs> All right. So so moving on to yes. what um what you will do, mm. which is producing a YouTube series called mm. Red Umbrella Talk. Yes. Um I remember when I saw this come out, I was really intrigued. And um, I mean, I think that you're sparking conversations that are so important, especially now. I mean, I remember you know, I've been in this industry a long time and sex work is like a new term. Mm. This was not around 20 years ago. Um, and I love it because it's this term that encompasses so many different things. It's the porn star. It's the content creator. It's the, um, you know, escort. It's the yeah. prostitute. It's the whatever. It's all those things because it used to be like, oh, you're a porn star or you're a hooker. Mm -hmm. And like porn stars wouldn't work with hookers because they're dirty. I mean, it was literally like throwing rocks from glass houses. Like the industry, a lot of industry infighting and a lot of what we call horiarchy. 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 Yeah. Horiarchy? Horiarchy. It's horiarchy is how it's spelled. Oh, I was doing ho. H O E hoarchy. But you've heard the term horarchy. Hor- horarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's horarchy, right? Yeah, horarchy. It's not horiarchy. Horarchy. <laughs> Just say it with the confidence, right? Horarchy. Fuck it. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, however, because it's not a real word. It's it's. I mean, it is, but it's one we made up as an industry. So I don't know. I can't find it in the fucking dictionary and find the proper pronunciation. But anyways, um, and so I love that like sex work kind of you know, eliminates all of that, at least the idea around the term is that like we're all equals who engage in sex in some way Mm. for work. Mm. Uh, So yeah, tell me about how you came up with this Mm. idea, the guests you've interviewed, what you've learned from it, all of that. So Red Umbrella Talk, over my years of being so excited about the work I've done in the adult industry, interviewing the folks that I have observing and participating in the industry in the ways that I have extreme pride, extreme thrill, extreme excitement to tell other people what this has been like and what I'm learning and how I'm enjoying it and how incredible that person is and how fucking inspiring that person is. And I bridge both. Okay. I bridge the adult industry and I'm also, I have a lot of connections in mainstream, Mm -hmm. be it some of the work that I do every once in a while, be it uh, my, my social circle, Every time I would bring a little piece of thrill or a story to my mainstream conservative non-sex work circles, every once in a while I would be met with the opinion of some bullshit misconception. Mm. Well, how can you say that? Don't they come from grand misery? Can't Mm -hmm. someone help these people? Mm -hmm. My God, isn't everyone in that industry- uh, Sex trafficked. Sex trafficked or suffering or dealing with some kind of addiction. I got so sick 
of this shit because it's 2023. And I realized all of their information, all of their opinions are informed from a really unfortunate source called mass media depictions of sex work, Mm -hmm. which is fabricated. Mm -hmm. It is falsified. It is made extreme in these these mutated, bloated versions of what they think sex work is for dramatic effect. This is not the reality of it. And I would try. I would get into these heated debates and say, no, you don't understand. You really need to educate yourself. You really need to talk with these folks. You really need to read this or learn that. And I said, you know what? I want to take all these questions I want to take the questions from the general public and I want to bring them right to the workers doing these jobs. So Red Umbrella Talk is five episodes. Uh, It's an episode dedicated to what I would say are the the general, the general uh, um, components within sex work. Okay, the the professions within it. You've got uh, porn, porn performing, pornography. You've got escorting, full service sex work. You've got professional domination. You've got stripping, exotic dancing, nightclub work. And then you've got an episode that's dedicated to the legalities, Mm -hmm. which are so fucking complex in this country, especially. So I sat with two lawyers that um, work within First Amendment rights. So we're talking a lot about censorship, freedom of speech, and all the FOSTA-SESTA bullshit that really fucked up the industry, Mm -hmm. uh, made it very dangerous for a lot of workers. Um, So I I, I spent a long time gathering questions from uh, friends, of course. I had an open email inbox for people on my social media that wanted to send me questions for one of these professions or sex work in general. Um, And then I prodded people specifically. I said, I want a mental health professional to submit a question. I want a medical professional to submit a question. I want a legal professional to submit a question. I want someone in law enforcement to submit a question. Mm -hmm. And then I asked some family members. I brought all of these questions together and I sifted them into what episode would make the most sense. And these are what these episodes are. Mm -hmm. So it's conversations where we basically present these questions from the misinformed general public direct to the workers themselves. And it was it was an incredible project to to be in pre-production and production with and, of course, post Uh, funding this. Thank God for the good people at Motor Bunny. They came in with a huge amount of the funding to make this possible. They believed in this project from the jump. Um, I, of course, did a huge crowdfunding effort and saw so much support from people that do believe in the mission mm-hmm. and uh, are supporters of me, which is great. And was uh, this was something that, of course, I shared producing with my dear friend Ellen Stagg. Mm-hmm. So Ellen and I came together and really busted our asses to make this thing happen. And the Museum of Sex was so kind to give us a venue, uh, a very illustrious one to host this at. Yeah, it looks very professional looking. Yeah. Yeah. It looks I, great. I, it was incredible to be able to do that with them. Do you have, this is probably an unfair question, Mm. um, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Do you have a favorite episode? Yeah, I do. Professional domination. Okay. Um, You know, I, 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 that facet of sex work in particular really, um, I just love how deep the psychology goes. I mean, they all have deep psychology to them where we're investigating what makes humans tick and just how natural uh, the pursuit of pleasure is, but it's the the confrontation of what some specific requests and experiences are and maybe the the understanding of why we as a society deem this work so taboo what the healing element is within it how people do process trauma through these experiences with professional dominatrixes or dominatrixes that shit blows my mind yeah it blows my mind i mean it's it's so vast the reasons why we seek out, whether it's a surrender of power or whether it's actual full-blown pain Mm -hmm. or a denial of sorts. My God, I Mm -hmm. I could talk about that shit for the rest of my life. (laughs) What do you find to be like the most interesting kink that people have? I, I, oh, that is such a tough one. The most interesting kink. Um, the ones perhaps where people are looking to relive a trauma they've experienced. Mm. Whether or not they want to play the part of themselves reliving it again, Mm -hmm. whether or not they want to play the part of the person who perhaps 
affected them Mm -hmm. in a traumatic way. Yeah. That to me is a very powerful exchange. And to seek that out, we run from trauma. Yeah. We run from the shit that has scarred us and scared us. So the idea of wanting to hire a professional to lead you back into it, to confront it head on, Mm -hmm. that shit is wild. Fascinating. It is, but also in a space where you're safe Mm -hmm. and you have control. I mean, because obviously as long as you're working with a professional Mm -hmm. who understands boundaries Mm -hmm. and you have safe words and all those kinds of things. I've talked to a, a lot of women who have, you know, done exactly that, you know, kind of relive their trauma mm. in in a safe space with someone that they trusted where they knew that they could actually end it because yeah. the initial trauma, they had no control. That's right. And that was what, you know, created the fear. It and so be- reliving it without, without that um, is healing for them. And yeah. that sounds counterintuitive, I think, to a lot of people. But when you hear people break it down and explain why it's helpful, like, you know, yeah. it starts to make sense. Our – it's uh, to our core what makes us the most unique is our our sexual preferences our sexual triggers that stir about an arousal mm-hmm. within us and i think if you can if you can find healing through accepting yourself as a sexual person as a sensual person if you can if you can embrace that there's such an incredible world and life of understanding that you get to reap the rewards of mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's for me that it's it's and not every professional in the world of of pro dom uh, spheres, not everyone caters to that specifically. Yeah. There are people that say, yes, I will do confrontational trauma reenactment. Not everyone does it. Yeah. But those ones really blow my mind. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, you're really being entrusted with something incredibly sacred and mm. important. I mean, that's mm. a lot of responsibility on you. Yeah. Yeah. It's remarkable. <laughs> so, um, what is the most, the biggest misconception that you find people have about those in sex work from your experience with this podcast? That professionals in sex work don't feel proud of themselves. That professionals in any facet of sex work have a negative relationship with themselves. That's the biggest misconception. It's an incredible, it's an incredible, an incredible stance of pride in oneself to not just explore this side of themselves, to then share it, to then knowingly pursue it in a society that wants to keep you down. Talk about a fucking strength and resilience. Mm -hmm. We're not blind to the stigma that's out there. We are very aware of it. But there's something that compels us to continue exploring this and and sharing it, and yes, profiting from it, and you know, making a living this way. But it's because uh, we, as humans, instinctively have a very severe fascination with with sexuality and, yeah. and pursuing pleasure. So, um, I, I think that uh, we are enlightened. I think we are, and I think this whole misconception is the uh, the the poison that we feed ourselves, so that we may not ever have to go on that journey, which is unpredictable. Maybe Mm -hmm. I'll learn something about my sexuality that I don't know if I can accept. Ooh, maybe I'll learn something about myself that might be different from what I've been uh, 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 telling people. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll learn something that I don't know how I feel about. You got to be a real fucking warrior to go in and and do this work. Yeah. You got to. And so I I say, bravo. Yeah. Holy hell. Yeah. I mean... It is, it is crazy too, because, you know, people come in and then they try to leave and get a real job. This is like the thing that frustrates me the most. And they go out and try to get a real job and then they literally like can't get a real job because Mm. they did porn at one point, you know? And it's just like, it's so, it's so infuriating because it's like society views them as sexual deviants, Mm -hmm. you know, as criminals. Right. And it's like, not the case right. at all. No, uh, uh, society deems them as you know someone who uh, who lost their way, mm. who has fallen uh, in a bad way. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I will acknowledge that yes, there are there is a population of people in sex work that are unfortunately they have found themselves there for there for some some misfortune. Mm-hmm. Of course there are. Yeah, but there are people that have found themselves working at uh, Wells Fargo. 
hating every fucking moment of it. Yeah, absolutely. Because of some misfortune. Yeah. Perhaps it's been handed down by, you know, uh, uh, the family that's been in the business forever and they mm -hmm. hate it. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole kind of torture and struggle in itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people out there who hate their jobs. Hell yeah. I mean, the, the nice thing about the about being, especially like an independent content creator, which so many people are now is, is cause somebody did ask me like, what is like the best thing about, you know, this work? And I was like, I think it's like the freedom to be able to kind of work when you want to, oh, yeah. which is so nice. But also it's, yeah. it's hard because you don't get to rely on a steady paycheck, like as an employee, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're only getting the money that you work for. Yeah, you also got to be your own motivator. Mm -hmm. You also got to be your own hold you to accountability person uh -huh. that says, hey, have you worked this week or not? How about a live stream? Let's get in that inbox. Let's start pushing some content. Like, yeah, yeah that shit's annoying. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you recently shot something that you called your entry into the industry with <laughs> Romy Rain. Can What can you tell us about that? So uh, Romy and I are very dear friends. She's, I, I, I would say, best friend. I absolutely fucking adore her. And uh, we, we like to do a lot of content together. We do mm -hmm. live streams together ever since our podcast that we did a few years ago. There's a fan base that loves us doing things together. And hey, guess what? We enjoy it too. So it's very easy to get together and do it. But uh, I always like to to find adventurous ways to make sexy content that don't cross my boundary. Mm -hmm. And Romy is so respectful of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like she's never like, come on, let's just do a girl, girl. She doesn't go there. She knows what my yeah. limits are yeah. and she fucking respects them. But I'll say to her, I've got a weird idea for something. We should do it. Like I love spit. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love the variety of spit that you can shoot it out like a bullet from your mouth. It can land and splatter, or you can pull it up like syrupy strings of rope. I love the varieties of spit. And I said to her, you know what I will do? Let's do some spit art. And we made a very spitty duet. I'm going to call it a spit duet. A spit duet, a huh? A spit duet. Is this a video? It's a video, and uh, it is... Beautiful. Oh my God. I mean, the daylight twinkling through the saliva Dude. is ridiculous. <laughs> I gotta say, like, whenever I shoot stuff like that, like anything involving spit blowjob, pussy eating, whatever, I'm always like, give me those trails of spit. And if I get beautiful trails of spit with the light behind it, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm like, oh, look at that. Spit. Like, yeah. literally to me, like, yeah. as a photographer, I know that that is gold. Yeah. Yeah, this it's is exactly so what I wanted. That. I wanted us to capture was I was like, "Girl, let's make this like a spit worship video." And uh, and and she after we shot that, she goes, "This could be your entry if you wanted it to be. <laughs> this if you wanted it to be, this could be your entry." I said, yeah, "I'll think about it, but no, I'm good." And what was so sweet was that we held that video for a long time, and we got the edit back on it. And my God, what a beautiful stance to take here. Romy checked in with me constantly. Did you watch it? How do you feel about it? Mm -hmm. Is it too much? Because we don't need to do anything with it. And I said, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's weird. It's art. It's like very freaky in a sense. And mm -hmm. I like it. And I said, let's fucking do it. But I like that, you know, I've got a friend that checks in along the way. Yeah. Which I think people need yeah. in, in this industry, especially when you start doing collaborative work. Um, you want to walk away from it and have that check in afterwards. Yes. So, yeah. So if people were to check out your work, I'm assuming you have an OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of content can they get there? I do a lot of dick ratings. Mm, I do dick ratings, my favorite. Love dick ratings. I do a lot of JOIs in mm -hmm. very different characters. I do a lot Wait, of... Wait, what do you mean different characters? Well, sometimes you want it nice and mm -hmm. Stepford Wivesy, and you've had a long day, and sometimes you want it really fucking mean. I mean, like, sandpaper on the flesh. Mm. So I like having that versatility there. I do a lot of verbal bullying for small some, penis humiliation small penis humiliation but even more than that like like bullying um I, I don't know what it is it might be that I'm six feet tall it mm -hmm. might be that I have a very readily available vocabulary at all times but um my fan base on these platforms is a large majority of highly submissive subscribers. Mm. And to them, they really want to be pushed around. And it's fun. I mean, I, 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 I welcome it. I love it. I'm very good at it. I'm comfortable in that realm. Mm -hmm. And I love, I love that, that trade-off. 
Mm -hmm. seeing just how far they'll debase themselves and just how high and mighty I can get. Why Mm -hmm. not? (laughs) You know, I've had a couple of people request those from me and I'm just like, I thought that I'd be really good at being mean to people. And I'm just not that, I'm not that good at it. Oh, come on. I know. I feel like, I feel like I should be great at this. Oh yeah. Oh, you maybe I just need more, maybe I just need more practice. You just got to sit with it. I, 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 I've had some incredible chats with fans mm-hmm. about you know the things that they want me to do they fantasize about me doing to them i want you to remove me entirely from the gene pool i want you to completely castrate me and make me useless i want you like th- these are fucking incredible pieces of literature you know like it's amazing it, it how blows like my mind imagine yeah. the imagination of these people i right? love it <laughs> and i'm like this is this is awesome that you're comfortable in this way and that you've you've developed this and explored it for yourself wow yeah Yeah. And, you know, I love that too. And I think that a lot of people respond to that because, you know, so often if they went to a partner or something with those kinky fantasies, they would be shamed and Mm. humiliated, but they can pay you to be shamed and humiliated in the way that they want to be. And let this be a public uh, service announcement here. I do believe, now I'm not a medical professional, but I do believe that unspoken desires become the tumors in our body. Mm. I do believe that. You hold on to that shit for too long. You don't even begin to explore it or look underneath whatever you've blanketed it with. Mm -hmm. The longer you hold on to that shit, it's going to eat you alive. It also kind of, I've found that, you know, people, when they suppress their sexuality, you see this a lot in like very conservative countries that it just comes out in other sick and twisted ways. Absolutely. You know what I mean? It, it finds like the edges and the and the breaks and the cracks in the mold to like seep out of and it comes out in a very unhealthy it, it makes, way that damages other people. It makes us feel powerless when we are unable to acknowledge our desires, yeah. when we are unable to confront them. Yeah. So how else can we feel powerful in violent outbursts, in cruelty, mm-hmm. in uh, vicious attacks yeah. on our own communities. That's what that is. Yeah. That's what I believe it is. Wholeheartedly. No, I, Quote me on that shit. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, human sexuality is a powerful driving force. I mean, it's literally like the life force behind our entire existence, right? Like we are alive because two people had sex with each other. Right. Um, so I think that there's a lot to that that denying that those basic urges um, all, is very unhealthy. We all have a sexuality. Yeah. It's the one thing that's a guarantee. I mean, other than death and taxes, we have a sexuality, even if that sexuality says, I don't want to have sex mm-hmm. or I don't want to receive pleasure in this way or that way or that way. We all have a sexuality, a sexual identity. So you cannot avoid it. Why would you avoid it? You're shuttering off an entire part of your your humanity, your existence. It's like, don't go in the West Wing, you know, like, fuck mm-hmm. it. I want to go down there. Yeah. And you should. Yeah. You should. It's fucking parties in the West Wing. Fuck yeah, they are, right? Crazy orgy Woo, parties you've been in the West there? Wing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Laura, thank you so much for coming on. This has been an absolute pleasure. Um, are you planning on doing a season two of Red Umbrella Talk? Yes, Ellen Stagg and I are going to uh, get to work very soon on season two. We'd like to explore some of the uh, uh, other areas that we haven't touched on yet. Mm-hmm. The trans experience, we'd like to touch on the actual uh, individuals working in the medical fields that are making help and access to any kind of medical care available to sex workers. We would like to speak to legacy sex workers, people that mm-hmm. have been doing this throughout the the eras of their life that are reaching those golden years. I think that there's a lot we we can still uncover. Yeah. And uh and yeah, we're 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 pulling it together. It's taken a little bit longer than we wanted to, but mm-hmm. uh as do anything that uh seems to be worthy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Where can people go to submit their questions? Redumbrellatalk.com. Fantastic. Yeah, come get it. And then let everybody else know all the valuable links where they can get more Laura from. Right here. Uh, I want you to be in touch with all things Laura Desiree. So please go to lauraxdesiree.me. You can also find me on social media at lauraxdesiree. Thank you. Fantastic. (laughs) And you guys can find me as always 
on Instagram and on Twitter at Holly Randall. Um, go to hollylinks.com just to get links to all of my various social media platforms. And of course, if you want to support this podcast and access the live streams as they happen, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Make sure you drop Laura a follow. Tell her that you found her through this episode so she knows that I did not waste her time. Thanks, guys. See you next time.